Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Pellerin, and I've been practicing dentistry since 1973. I've seen problems with bruxism during my career, but nothing like I've seen over the last few years. Along the way, I've also been the patient. I've experienced the pain of musculoskeletal misalignment. In this course, I hope to demystify the problems related to TMJ pathology and muscular harmony. This is my view as a treating doctor and as the patient. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Pellerin, a practicing dentist in Auburn Hills, Michigan. I've been practicing dentistry for over 40 years. And during that time, I've seen many patients that suffer from bruxism, that is clenching and grinding of the teeth. However, while I have seen it over the last 40 years, the last five to 10 years in my practice, I have seen a great increase in this problem. At some of the courses I have attended, other dentists describe this as an epidemic. Furthermore, along with treating patients in my practice, I am also a patient myself. Over 30 years ago, I began to notice shoulder, neck, and headache pain so bad that I went to a hospital and had an MRI taken. They could find no reason for the problem, and it was suggested I simply take medications. Even as a dentist, I was totally unaware that I was clenching my teeth. I had no tooth pain or jaw pain at all. Finally, I got a little pain in my left TMJ. I made a splint and found that my shoulder and neck and headache pain were alleviated. This was the beginning of a passionate journey to learn more about bruxism, the temporomandibular joint and treatment modalities. I took courses from many experts from different points of view. And also I treated my own patients and undertook my own treatment with the help of some local specialists. In the following CE course, I will present a basic description of TNJ anatomy and pathology and the relationship between the temporomandibular joint and muscle pathology. It will also encompass the various forms of tooth damage, head and neck pain that are related to this problem. On many occasions, the public at large and even some dentists will refer to any of these problems, lumping them all together and they say he or she has TMJ. Well, everyone has two TMJs. It has become a catchphrase to describe any problem with clenching and grinding, tooth damage, head and neck pain, and joint pain. I'll point out that while TMJ pathology predisposes people to bruxism, head and neck pain, in my opinion, it is not all about the joint. In fact, it is much more about the muscles. We'll also address the pros and cons of a number of contemporary treatment modalities. I will come back to this later in the course as I show how and why I was reconstructed to be comfortable and pain-free with treatment that not all clinicians will agree with or understand. However, while many academics and many clinicians may not agree with how I was treated, I can tell you, being the patient and actually having the pain gives you a much larger perspective that can only be obtained while suffering as a patient. I further have maintained my stable jaw situation and lack of pain for well over 10 years with no end in sight. To begin, let's look at some basic TMJ anatomy. The temporomandibular joint is at the base of the skull just in front of the ear. It consists of the glenoid fossa concavity that is ideally is the distal resting point for the condyle or head of the mandible. Between the condyle and glenoid fossa is the articular disc, a fibrous extension of the joint capsule. It is meniscus in shaped. Ideally, the disc travels with the condyle during opening as the condyle travels away from the joint and down the eminence. The three main muscle groups in play are the masseter and pterygoids, medial and lateral, also the temporalis. There are many types of pathology in the joint. They include arthritis, calcifications, bone spurs, flattening of the head of the mandible, but by far the most common problem is anterior dislocation of the disc. This video 
will explain this simply and clearly. The temporal mandibular joint, the TMJ, is the joint between the lower jawbone, the mandible, and the temporal bone of the skull. The TMJ is responsible for jaw movement and is the most used joint in the body. The TMJ is essentially the articulation between the condyle of the mandible and the mandibular fossa, a socket in the temporal bone. A unique feature of this joint is the articular disc, a flexible and elastic cartilage that serves as a cushion between the two bone surfaces. The disc lacks nerve endings and blood vessels in its center and is therefore insensitive to pain. Anteriorly, it attaches to the lateral pterygoid muscle, a muscle of chewing. Posteriorly, it continues as retrodiscal tissue, fully supplied with blood vessels and nerves. The mandible is the only bone that moves when the mouth opens. The first 20 millimeter opening involves only a rotational movement of the condyle within the socket. For the mouth to open wider, the condyle and the disc must move out of the socket, forward and down the articular eminence, a convex bone surface located anteriorly. This movement is called translation. The most common disorder of the TMJ is disc displacement. And in most cases, the disc is dislocated anteriorly. As the disc moves forward, the retrodiscal tissue is pulled in between the two bones. This can be very painful as this tissue is fully vascular and innervated, unlike the disc. The forward dislocated disc is an obstacle for the condyle movement when the mouth is opening. In order to fully open the jaw, the condyle has to jump over the back end of the disc and onto its center. This produces a clicking or popping sound. Upon closing, the condyle slides back out of the disc, hence another click or pop. This condition is called disc displacement with reduction. In a later stage of disc dislocation, the condyle stays behind the disc all the time, unable to get back onto the disc. The clicking sound disappears, but mouth opening is limited. This is usually the most symptomatic stage, the jaw is said to be locked as it is unable to open wide. At this stage, the condition is called disc displacement without reduction. Fortunately, in the majority of cases, the condition resolves on its own after some time. This is thanks to a process called natural adaptation of the retrodiscal tissue, which after a while becomes scar tissue and can functionally replace the disc. In fact, it becomes so similar to the disc that it's called a pseudo disc. There are various forms of TMJ pathology, and the video explained the most common problem. With a disc out of position, the muscles try to keep the fossa and condyle in contact, but work overtime because the disc is not in between them anymore. However, does everyone with bruxism problem need to have joint pathology for them to clench and grind? The numbers don't add up. Many estimate that at least 30% of the population suffers from bruxism. The ADA says up to 95% of the population suffers from bruxism at some point in their life. A very recent survey, February 2020, poll by Dentaltown indicates that 63% of those that suffer are between 35 and 55 years of age, with another 22% between the age of 18 and 35. The same survey said 38% of dentists have noticed an increase in young patients who have been previously treated with orthodontics. Some estimates of people with TMD or temporomandibular joint disease are between 10 and 12%. I think that is high. It's clear the number of people with bruxism problems don't all have joint problems. I believe people can have a perfectly healthy joint and with enough stress, they will brux. Now, let's look at the problems that are related to bruxism. One of the most common and easily recognizable problems related to bruxism is wearing and flattening of the teeth, both anterior and posterior. Even if a patient is not aware that they are clenching and grinding their teeth, the dental professional can easily see the wear. This is an ongoing problem. 
The patient should know if they don't do something to intercede, the problem will continue with more tooth damage likely and pain may also result. This will also result in more dental work being required. While tooth fracture and fracture of restorations can occur during chewing, especially when biting on a hard object or hard piece of food that you didn't know was there, clenching and grinding of the teeth is an increasing problem that can cause tooth damage even while you're sleeping. Gum line notching of teeth. Many have attributed this gum line notching or ab fracture to toothbrushing. And while this may have some effect, more and more professionals understand the notching relates to tooth clenching. As jaw muscles contract and the teeth are forced together, the root of the tooth is held in the bone. It can't move, but the tooth can flex. And these flexural forces are manifest mainly at the gum line, causing minor chipping or ab fracture at the gum line. Bone loss, loss of alveolar bone, which is the bone that holds and supports the root of the tooth, could happen for many reasons. Gum disease is by far the biggest cause. However, bruxism can be another factor. Even with healthy gums and bone, the forces of clenching and grinding can contribute to bone loss. And unless this is recognized and dealt with, even with healthy periodontal system, bone loss will continue. Root canal treatment with no caries or other causes evident. This is seen on many teeth that we call virgin teeth. No decay, no filling, yet still it needs a root canal. How can this be? As your muscles contract and the teeth come together under extreme pressure, it can push the root into the alveolar socket, pressing on the nerves and blood vessels at the end. When this goes on long enough, blood supply is interrupted and the tooth nerve and blood supply will die. Resorption. Under trauma, cells around the root called osteoclasts can be stimulated and actually eat away at the tooth. This is different than decay and worse. It usually results after some type of trauma. In this case, I and a lot of root canal specialists believe the trauma of clenching and grinding is making this more prevalent today. Generalized tooth sensitivity typically to hot and cold with no underlying dental cause. Many patients will come in and say, all my teeth are very sensitive to hot and cold and they don't have any dental problems. Same issue as described in root canal treatment with no apparent cause evident in these people. Clenching or grinding can push the roots into the socket. The circulation of the tooth is worse in this area, very poor. When pressure is put on the blood vessels at the end of the root, there can be an inflammation preventing blood supply to the tooth. The nerve reaction to this is angry, typically sensitive to hot and cold. Toothache, when no other dental problem is evident. This is not an uncommon occurrence. I see it frequently in my practice. Patient comes in, tooth has symptoms of root canal. Hot, cold, pressure, but no apparent cause. Sometimes, even in the absence of dental work, teeth shift. A couple teeth will hit more than the other teeth, particularly during excursions. In these cases, my first course of action is to do occlusal adjustment on these teeth. The patient can't tell their teeth are shifting. All they know is they have pain. I have solved many toothaches this way, even when other dentists told the same patient they need a root canal. Extremely tight cheek muscles and inability or difficulty to open or open wide. Again, many patients may be clenching or grinding and not be aware of it. They have tight, very tight musculature. The dental professional can pick this up during routine exams and have follow-up questions to see if intervention is appropriate. Vertigo or balance problems. The head of the condyle is directly in front of the ear. The center for balance is in the middle ear. Under force, it can push the condyle backwards, pressing on the middle ear, resulting in vertigo. Crepitus or cracking during opening and closing. This can be related to bruxism as the condyle is forced into the joint, causing abnormalities. Even calcifications can result in these noises occurring. Jaw pain and tightness 
are a clear indicator the patient is clenching or grinding and they need help. Ringing in the ears or tinnitus can occur as the jaw is forced back into the ear during clenching compressions. Ear pain can also result for the same reason. Shoulder and neck pain. This is harder to understand. How can clenching of jaw muscles cause shoulder and neck pain? As your muscles contract, it can cause a reflex contraction of shoulder and neck muscles. I call this musculoskeletal reflex contraction. I experienced this in another part of my body when I pulled cartilage in my chest directly over my heart, a very frightening, intense pain. But by the end of the day, the pain had traveled 180 degrees to my back. As the muscles in my chest contracted in response to the torn cartilage, the muscles on the other side had a reflex contraction. The same thing happens in the head and neck. With jaw muscles contract, a reflex contraction can happen in the shoulder and neck area. Headache pain. This is the same concept of reflex contraction that I just described. As the jaw muscles contract, it can cause contraction of muscles in the temporal area or in the back of the head as a reflex contraction or balancing contraction to the jaw muscles. The people that make Botox understand this as Botox is used for migraine headaches. They inject the jaw muscles with Botox, and this can prevent contraction of the muscles in the head that causes migraines for many people. Treatments. We have talked about many symptoms and problems caused by and related to clenching and grinding of teeth. Now I want to discuss the various treatment paths and devices that are available to us and our patients. Physical therapy. This can include several modalities, including massage therapy, heat, cold therapy, stretching, ultrasound, stretching of individual muscle groups, referral to the dentist for an evaluation of teeth and occlusal problems, chiropractor and acupuncture therapy is sometimes employed. Botox injections. Many of you may have seen Botox commercials for migraine headaches. Or these commercials don't explain how and why Botox is used and how it can prevent migraines. Some of the main injection points for Botox are in the masseter, temporalis, and pterygoid muscles, the muscles that help to close the jaw. The people that make Botox understand that as the muscles of the jaw contract with great intensity, it can cause reflex contraction in the shoulder and neck and head muscles that can lead to migraines. This is a point I have made before and will come back to shortly. Reconstructive jaw surgery. This is an option I considered during my personal treatment. In my case, it would have consisted of sectioning the maxilla into an anterior and two posterior segments and resection of the mandible. The goal is to reposition the maxilla and mandible so the muscles and joint are in harmony and the teeth are in position to support both. Sounded extreme to me. The surgeon said, it's really not that big of a deal. And it probably isn't for him. Then I talked to a colleague whose assistant had the procedure done. She was 30 years younger than me and was just getting back to work after about eight weeks. Orthodontic treatment. This is done to reposition the teeth so they will be in better harmony to support muscle and joint comfort and function. This is particularly important for children. If a child is having problems with bruxism, jaw pain, joint pain, and headaches, it should be particularly considered during the pubertal growth spurt when orthodontic treatment is best done. Prosthetic reconstruction. This is ultimately the course that I chose for my own situation. It's important to note that myotronics was used to find muscle harmony for reconstruction. This jaw position often will not match the previous occlusion. The old adage, if you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail comes into play. Every specialist may think he has the best solution, but in fact, the solution varies from patient to patient. At the beginning of this course, I talked about my unique perspective as both the doctor and the patient. Now I'd like to come back to that and show you how and why I was reconstructed prosthetically with a full mouth reconstruction. When I was in dental school and opened my mouth, there was a pop on my left TMJ that could be heard 20 feet away. But 
other than the noise, I didn't have pain or function problems until I got into my 30s. I had no tooth pain, but shoulder and neck pain and headache pain were so bad that I had an MRI taken at a local hospital. They had no clue as to what was wrong or why I was in pain. Finally, I got pain in my left TMJ, the one with the anterior displaced disc and the pop. That started my journey, taking courses from different points of view and treating my own patients and myself with the help of some local specialists. As I previously mentioned, I considered the surgical option, which would have required sectioning of the mandible bilaterally and maxillary sectioning into three sections. The surgical option would have provided repositioning for the muscles and joint. However, at close to 60 years old, the time for healing and time away from the practice, possible negative sequelae such as paresthesia, et cetera, I decided to go with a prosthetic rebuild. Dr. Daniel Schwab, a TMJ specialist in Southfield, Michigan, who was my mentor, helped to lead this reconstruction of my mouth. Dan had many years of experience treating all kinds of patients with head and neck pain. He believed the muscles and not the joint itself were the key factor in success for treating TMD patients and the head and neck pain they experience. Years before Dan and I undertook my treatment, he had experienced with some amazing problems that were very difficult to solve. In the early days of treatment, 80s and 90s and even before, surgical intervention was done to reposition displaced articular discs. Even more extreme, in one Illinois experiment, a group of nuns from Chicago area had their condyles surgically removed. The thought was, these condyles are causing the problem in the joints, so let's just cut them off. These poor nuns were now dental cripples. No one knew what to do with them, and they came to Dan for help. Using myotronics, he was able to find the muscles position that was happy. He was able to rebuild them with splint therapy to support the jaw and muscle position of harmony. Even with this calamitous situation, Dan was able to restore these nuns to function in relative comfort in an almost impossible situation. This is a comb beam radiography of my reconstruction and joint position with Dan's help and the help of a local prosthodontist. Again, with the aid of myotronics and computer tracking, Dan was able to find where my muscles would be most comfortable. I was originally a class two division two occlusion with my mandible force too far back into the joint and my vertical dimension overclosed. With myotronic guidance, my vertical dimension was open about six millimeters and my mandible advanced about seven millimeters and a lower splint was then formed which I wore 24 seven to be sure this new jaw position would be functional and comfortable. I was then rebuilt prosthetically with crown and bridge. This position, as you can see, the condyle is halfway down the eminence, not close to my joint, and my joint is not angry with me. In fact, it is quite happy, and so are my muscles. My left TMJ with anterior disc displacement no longer pops or clicks and I have normal range of motion and I'm pain-free. My main point is that sometimes muscular harmony and skeletal anatomy don't always match. And it's more about the happiness of the muscles than the joint. A one side note I'd like to mention, during the course of my treatment, the prosthodontist who was doing this work said, I think you're open a little too far. We got to close that vertical about three millimeters. I said, I don't know. Doesn't sound good to me. He closed it. And three days later, I was up at three o'clock in the morning, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, pain. I had to make a splint for myself, open it, the three millimeters. I can tell you, the articular disc does not have any innervation, but the capsule space behind the condyle has a lot of nerve and blood supply. And once that tissue rebounds, if you try to force the mandible back there, you are in a horrible situation as I experienced myself. Having said that, even with perfect TMJ anatomy and muscle harmony, I think with enough stress, virtually anyone can suffer from bruxism. 
Therefore, in these stressful times, there are many, many people that could benefit from some type of splint therapy to protect their teeth and prevent joint, neck, and head pain, especially during the night. These days, many of us clinicians are recognizing, testing, and treating obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, either with lab-fabricated mouth guards or CPAP. I have a number of patients that wear a dental appliance for bruxism while wearing CPAP. Studies suggest there is a definite two-way relationship between OSA and sleep bruxism, but the coincidence or incidence of it is not a one-to-one -one basis. Commonalities existing between OSA and bruxism. Are they related to upper airway obstruction, whereby bruxism may be a normal physiological reactive protective mechanism? If so, could sleep bruxism be utilized as a reliable and valid surrogate clinical marker for OSA? A study at the University of Houston Medical School assessed the prevalence of bruxism and GERD among 300 people with OSA. They found that 25.6% of these patients also suffer from bruxism. The incidence was higher in men than women and higher in Caucasians than any other group. According to the American College of Chest Physicians, sleep disorders such as sleep apnea can lead to many secondary health conditions. So in treating sleep apnea, clinicians must also recognize and address secondary health conditions such as bruxism in order to fully manage the patient's sleep disorder. While this CE course is focused on bruxism, we should be aware that patients who report their OSA should also be checked for signs of bruxism and vice versa. Confirmation diagnosis of OSA involves sleep monitor testing and degrees of severity are multiple. The clinical signs of bruxism are very apparent to every dental clinician and the bruxism can be treated immediately to relieve their pain. Orthonic or splint therapy. Traditional horseshoe splints. These full arch splints typically cover upper or lower teeth depending on the doctor's preference. They require full arch impressions, upper and lower, and a bite registration typically opening the occlusion three to four millimeters. This is the device of choice for a large majority of dentists, perhaps as much as 90%. They require lab fabrication and usually have a hard construction, although devices with a combination of hard occlusal and soft counterside are also made. I have made many of these devices myself over the last 40 years. They require frequently adjustments in both the fit of the retaining teeth and the occlusal side of the appliance. I've also worn these devices for many years myself. The advantage of the horseshoe splint is that all the teeth are protected, upper and lower teeth, and reports of bite changes or shifts are rare. It is a device most of us are comfortable with since most of us were taught this procedure as early as dental school, and we're just used to it. The disadvantages of the horseshoe splint. Chair time to take impressions and fit or spot the device on delivery. Although many patients wear the device, many more have a very hard time with a full arch appliance. Many have told me it's just too big. I have a hard time wearing it. Another is the cost with lab fees and chair time required. These typically cost five to $600 or more. And many patients, especially if they don't have adequate insurance, they find this an obstacle. Studies show that although this is plastic between the teeth. It does very little to reduce muscle activity. In fact, studies done by NTI show it can actually increase clenching forces. Many of my patients have reported when they wear this device, their jaw muscles are still sore and fatigued in the morning. Another problem, many patients don't wear these devices every day. Some are episodic nerves. And if it's left out for a while, the teeth can move and the device won't go back in, and they are very difficult to spot or adjust in. Posterior pad devices. These devices typically cover the bicuspids and molars, either in the upper or lower arch. Dr. Harold Gelb was one of the first to introduce these posterior pad devices. He used kinesiology to determine the correct vertical by having a patient extend their elbow to shoulder level, pushing down as he checked different verticals. Pushing down on the patient's elbow, he found where the patient had the greatest ability to resist. This was the best vertical to build to. Today, this procedure is still done, although many patients insert myotronics for kinesiology to determine the correct vertical. Myotronics uses TENS units to relax the muscles. Then magnets are inserted in the gum line, upper and lower, midline, 
and it is tracked on computer, determining the ideal vertical, and this is where the device is built. Some people find this device easier to wear than full arch devices. In theory, you are building a splint where the muscles are in their happy position. As a negative, these devices still require upper and lower impressions, extreme bite taking measures if myotronics are employed and laboratory fees. If myotronics are employed, some dentists charge as much as $2,500 or more dollars for the device. The NTI or NTI TSS, this is also called the nociceptive transmitter inhibition tension suppression system. It is made to fit the upper or lower two to four anterior teeth centered at the midline. A dome protrudes from the side it is fit on to contact with the opposing midline. Studies show this midline force can reduce muscle activity 60% or more. Also, it is the only bruxing appliance I have seen that has FDA clearance to treat migraine headaches, with 85% of their study group getting relief from migraine headaches. Advantages. It is smaller and easier to wear. It treats the bruxism problem at its source, the muscles. It provides perfect anterior guidance, protrusive and excursive movements. Note, some dentists and lay people think this anterior contact, which prevents the posterior teeth from coming together, will allow drifting or shifting of the posterior teeth. Studies show this is not true. In fact, the posterior teeth need to be out of occlusion for at least seven days for them to move permanently. Once the device is removed in the morning, any minor shifting will realign with normal occlusion function. While changes can occur, this is not from shifting of teeth. The NTI can reprogram muscles similar to myotronics. However, these changes are very rare, and the patient is instructed to stop wearing the device if the teeth don't align within one hour after removal. The patient has a choice. Stop wearing the device, go back to pain, and return to the old occlusion, or wear a full arch splint, or rebuild a bite where the muscles are happy disadvantages. Some dentists make these directly in the office, but many involve Keller labs to fabricate this, requiring impressions and lab fees. The dome is very hard and can chip or move the opposing teeth at the midline contact point. Again, this is very rare. This problem can be overcome by fabricating a thin suck down splint on the opposing arch, preventing tooth movement and opposing tooth damage. Some patients have a long center. Their mandible can slide back and not contact the device or the dome during the certain jaw movements. Myotronics or orthotic occlusal changes. After stimulating muscles with 10 units for an hour and recording ideal muscle and jaw position, it will often show that the teeth don't align with the ideal muscle and jaw position. Some orthotic appliances will elicit the same thing when the muscles are in their happy position, but the teeth don't match that position. The patient then has the option of permanent splint therapy, prosthetic reconstruction, or stop wearing the splint, you know, back to occlusion that they had before the muscles and joint were happy. Pain typically results. Over-the-counter or drugstore do-it-yourself devices. Typically, these devices don't work or fit very well. Some of them make the problem worse as people tend to clench or more into the soft or ill-fitting devices. Also, they have very limited durability at best. The appeal for the patient is they're cheap, they're easy to find, and you don't have to visit the dentist. The clear disadvantages as we professionals see them, I already mentioned. They're ill-fitting, they can cause the patient to actually grind more, and they don't last at all. I have tried and used every one of the professional treatments and devices I have shown you on myself and on my patients or both. The device I have come to use most often is Grind Relief. It is an anterior device based on the mechanism of action of the MTI. It can be formed over the upper or lower anterior six to eight teeth. Larger than the NTI, it allows the patient with long centric to still contact the device. It consists of a heat resistant shell with a dome or bar built inside the tray. Inside the shell is pre-inserted thermoplastic, which can be refit as many times as desired by immersing in hot water about 160 degrees. This device is best fit by the dentist or trained auxiliary, and it is best made with a opposing clear splint. 
this is where the best results come for the patient. Unlike the NTI, it puts pressure on the upper and lower midline at the same time, doubling the mechanism of action. Some studies have shown that the central bite force concentration can reduce muscle activity. But rather than rely on that, you can try the simple test at home. If you were to take a pencil and place it between your back teeth, you'll find that you can pretty much bite right through that pencil. But if you take the same pencil and put it between your upper and lower front teeth, the midline, you can't exert nearly as much force. This is how and why Grind Relief N is so effective. Here are some of the advantages. Typically, it takes about 10 minutes. There's no lab fees, no impressions. It can be formed that day for temporary relief or long-term treatment. Very little adjustment is necessary. It can be refit easily with no limit. It is a tight and secure fit. It is low cost to the dentist and one-time fitting with no lab fees. Easy for the assistant to make with no dentist involvement on the fitting. The product even comes with a three-year wear guarantee. It is the only device I know of that is really suitable for children with moving dentition, as it can be reformed indefinitely. The following video will show my assistant forming the grind relief, and you can see how easy this is. It takes her very little time, and if the patient doesn't like it, it can be refit again. This is a demonstration on grind relief. Here it is coming in the package. And Nicole is going to show how we soften this uh, in a couple of different ways. We have instant hot tap water in our office. So what we do is we use instant hot tap water and we're going to soften this. And you'll see how that changes from white and hard to clear and soft. So she's going to drop that in the shell side down, thermoplastic side up. Okay, so the device is now softened. And you can see that it's clear and soft. Now, Nicole is going to remove that and show... She's wetting her fingers. We typically do that so that the thermoplastic tends to stick less. And by the way, this is quite formable. You can go to the mouth directly with this. It is, uh, you can see how soft. She's folding that thermoplastic into the shell. And this is what we do before we uh, go to the mouth with it. Most people like this on, on the lower, although you can also fit it. Some, some prefer to go uh, on the upper. And when we do that, we typically grind that dome off custom in the lab with the lathe. Now she's forming border molding on the lingual and the buckle so that the, um, mm -hmm. to close. avoid sharp edges. Go ahead and open, go ahead and open. Okay, now relax your jaw and bite down. Good, go ahead and open. And that's pretty much it. And she's going to uh, take this out in a moment and we're going to shock it in a little cool water and then come back and make sure that that fits. Okay, so she's lifting this on and off sometimes a little bit as it's setting so you don't lock on there. If you leave this on too long, it's possible, although have a very, very seldom that it can lock on, but she's lifting it to make sure that doesn't happen. Nicole is going to just give it a little shock here to get it in the final set just to, to cool that, and then she'll come back and, and make sure that it fits. If, it's, if there's any problem, you can uh, do this as many times as you want. If it's too tight, you know, back into the hot water and, uh, and, and loosen it up if it's too tight. That's one of the more common uh, problems with it. Okay, now she's back in after she, she gave it a little shock, make sure that fits. Like I said, it can be adjusted. You don't have to grind on these things. Your best thing is to go back to the hot water if you don't like the fit, and you can do it as many times as you want. Typically, I'm not in the room when, mm -hmm. when this is being done. I'm doing a crown prep somewhere else, and she does this, uh, you know, sometimes multiple times during a day. The real beauty, too, patient doesn't have to get impressions off to the lab and get this a week, two weeks later. They've got results today. Mm -hmm. You can use it as a temporary splint or permanent. Now we have a model here we're going to use. Uh, our little suck down, an O2O clear splint. Now, Nicole has one here that's formed. And we sometimes will do this. So we're making the grind relief on the lower. Sometimes we'll, we'll do this on the upper. Make sure we don't get any tooth movement. Gives a little more vertical. Some people like this addition. And they can only get this at the dentist. Like the NTI, 
Grind relief can cause the muscles to relax and reprogram, like what myotronics or the NTI can do, causing changes in the occlusion. If bite or occlusion does not return to normal within one hour after removal, the patient is instructed to discontinue use. Again, this is very rare. Out of 10,000 appliances, we have about three reported instances, and the occlusion will go back once you start wearing the device if you choose to do that. However, patients are usually going to go back to a painful situation in which the muscles are not happy. After initial forming, the device may shrink over time, making it tight and sore on the teeth or gingiva. The patient should know an adjustment may be necessary later. Simply heat the device in hot coffee temperature water for 10 seconds. Reseat and lift the device until it is loose enough and comfortable. Of course, an extra fee is appropriate here. I charge what I feel the patient can afford based on their insurance and ability. Many clinicians charge the same fee they charge for a lab fabricated device, hundreds of dollars. I have found several CDA codes that work for billing purposes. Some practices I've heard from have applied this device to get the patient out of pain today. After a wait and see period, some of them move the patient to a more expensive, complicated modality. For most, the problem is solved and we get to be the hero. I get referral patients from this. In summary, we have looked at TMJ anatomy, different TMJ pathologies, the sequelae, which involves much more than the teeth. Also professional intervention from surgery to orthodontic treatment to prosthetic reconstruction. One thing is certain, in this stressful COVID-19 era, bruxism is at epidemic levels. Virtually every dentist is seeing an increase. This recent article in the news from a New York prosthodontist typifies what many of us are seeing. The ADA estimates that 12% of the population may suffer from TMJ pathology. They also say 95% of people will brux at some time. It's clear you don't need TMJ pathology to suffer from bruxism. Now, Let's look at the professional orthotic appliances available as a group. You have the full arch splint, which has been around for close to 120 years. You have the posterior pad devices. One of the first to advocate these was Dr. Harold Gelb. And now with Myotronics, you have a new and more expensive version available. You have the NTI appliance, which is smaller, easier to wear, and reduces dangerous muscle activity. More recently, you have the grind relief, which utilizes central bite force concentration, similar to the NTI, but extends occlusal contact into the bicuspid area. And with built-in thermoplastic is formable in the office that day by an auxiliary. It doubles the force of the NTI, putting pressure on the upper and lower midline at the same time. A large number of dentists, Perhaps as much as 90% form the full arch orthotic because that's what they were taught from dental school. And it has become somewhat of a standard. Also, change is always difficult. However, as one of my esteemed colleagues pointed out to me recently, what he doesn't like about the full arch orthotic is not only the time, impressions, models, lab fee, delay in getting the appliance with the patient needs right now, and adjustment, but the fact that many patients come back and say they can't wear it. It's too big, too bulky, too tight, and many patients are episodic in their wearing. They may leave it out for a couple of weeks. After this time, the teeth may slightly move and the device may no longer fit. Also, new crowns or restorations may require adjusting the device. No one device is suitable for every dentist or every patient. But the more options we have for treatment of this increasing problem, the better we will be able to treat our patients. Finally, no matter which appliance we choose to treat our patients, perhaps most importantly, we have to identify the patients with this problem, and it is huge. We are all so busy treating the task at hand, whether it be a crown, endo, routine restorative, or hygiene, we're focused on what we're doing. And I believe a high percentage of patients that need treatment are going undiagnosed, perhaps as many as 70%. I've gone through a number of maladies related to bruxism, from shoulder and neck pain to headaches and tooth sensitivity. I think the entire staff should be aware of the top five signs. This includes the assistants and hygienists, the entire team.
according to Blumenthal et al., only about 40% of the people suffering from nighttime bruxism complain or self-report, and pain is not always present at the onset of sleep bruxism. So we need to look and then ask. Number one, tight cheek musculatures. When you try to retract the cheek to examine, to do operative whatever, and it feels a steel curtain, also, the patient may have difficulty in opening or staying open. This person needs an appliance. Hygienist should know this and point it out to the dentist as he or she does the exam. Two, of course, tooth chipping, wearing, shortening of the teeth, posterior wear also. Number three, jaw tightness or pain in the shoulder and neck and even headache pain. Four, generalized tooth sensitivity. All the teeth are sensitive, with no apparent caries or other reason. My entire staff knows this is a bruxing problem. Five, ab fracture, lesions or chipping, notching of the tooth at the gum line. Recently, I was disappointed in myself after examining a new patient where I didn't recognize any of these signs. The patient had no dental problems. And as I was leaving the room, he said, one more thing, doctor. I have a problem with clenching and grinding my teeth. Is there anything you can do to help me? Ouch, I missed it. We need to ask the patient, whether it is the hygienist, the assistant, or the doctor, are you aware of clenching and grinding your teeth? Literature should be available in the waiting room, calling attention to this problem. Maybe even a small sign. Do you clench or grind your teeth? Tell us, we can help. Okay, so I see a few questions uh, on the screen here. Now, I'm going to start with the uh, top one. Um, can symptoms of toothache or sensitivity uh, cause some bruxism uh, by, uh, I'm not sure, it says by incomplete fracture or craze lines or not clinically visible? Yeah, well, the symptoms of tooth sensitivity, you don't need to see uh, visible lines. You don't need fracture, crazing, microfracture to have tooth sensitivity. Uh, tooth sensitivity, and I, I find it more in the clencher uh, than the bruxer. Clenchers can, they, they put tremendous force on, onto the teeth, and I've tried to illustrate it in the course, but what happens is, at the end of the root, the nerve and blood vessels and, uh, coming out, in and out of the tooth, the opening is so small uh, that um, it, the pressure con constricts on and presses on those nerve and blood vessels. In other parts of the body, uh, if you get bruised, you, you, your vessel can explain, expand and, 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 and it heals. In the, the, worst, the tooth has the worst uh, circulation of any place in the body. When you press on those blood vessels in particular and they inflame a little bit, the blood does not circulate uh, into the tooth and the nerve becomes angry, uh, cold usually. Uh, and when this goes on um, along with extreme enough, especially you don't do something about it, uh, I'm seeing, as I pointed out in the course, I, I do see it quite a bit of it, root canal treatment, endodontics, no caries, no pathology, it was related to uh, the forces uh, that were not, uh, nothing was done and the patient, the patient just ignored it. And, and after a while, if they could, I have people that come in and with these symptoms and if they tell them they're early enough, we identify it. If it's a couple of teeth, we do a little occlusal adjusting and, and take that pressure off and we can avoid the root canal. But if it goes on too far, uh, circulation imp uh, impaired, then you know, it, it can lead to endodontics. So um, then, uh, now, I think this is an interesting question. Is there evidence that loss of vertical dimension leads to headache, vertigo, or tinnitus? Well, I'll tell you that um, all of these uh, the headaches, you don't need loss of vertical dimension to have that happen. Um, it can be the overactive muscles, and I've tried to point it out in the course, how they can 
cause uh, muscular uh, discomfort. Ironically, I, I don't do a lot of uh, full mouth reconstruction, but I've, I've done some. My, my case was, was one, but I've done some other ones. And I, the, one of the worst ones I've done, this poor fellow had ground, his, his, cent, his lower centrals are probably about three millimeters long uh, from going. And he had ground anterior, posterior, his, he, he had collapsed vertical, no pain. <laughs> no pain and uh but you know we had to restore him and we opened his vertical and um with the help of myotronics uh which by the way i'm not an advocate of myotronics um i, I don't i don't uh, i'm not a um a full mouth reconstruction guy my my base my patient base is, is not in that economic uh, range uh but um you know, uh, it, you know, sometimes it has applications and, and for me it worked. I, uh, I have uh, no pain after uh, 15 years uh, reconstructing. And I know this, my case looks a little uh, to some dentists uh, like, oh my God, what are you doing? Um, but uh, the whole, in my course, I, I really think uh, that TMJ pathology predisposes people to clenching and grinding as airway obstruction does. You know, there's, there's, there's links there, but it's not a one-to-one -one link. And um, so that, um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, an individual thing. You gotta, you gotta look at the patient. I've got a lot of patients that, uh, you know, some have airway obstruction. When I suspect that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going for a sleep study. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether it's, um, they're using a CPAP machine. I do. I make a lot of Moses appliance myself, and I, I wear a Moses myself. And um, so that um, airway is it's it's part of the problem, but it's not every single. Um, it's not a one to one link. Okay. So here. Okay. Oh no! In some cases, would you consider addition of resin rather than occlusal adjustment? Um, well, you know, I didn't cover it in the course, but you know, you, if, if, if people are getting prematurities, particularly posterior prematurities, um, you know, uh, you, you've got to you've got to uh, take that out, or they're, they're going to get hyperactivity in the muscle in, in those areas. I don't do a lot of, um, you know, reestablishing cuspid rise with resins, but I do have. Uh, uh, doctors I know that do it and they have success with it. By the way, I'm a big fan of cuspid rise. I think that uh, anterior guidance, cuspid rise, uh, it's ideal. Unfortunately, I see a lot of patients with no anterior guidance at all and they still need help. So um, it's uh, it, it, in an ideal world, yeah, you, you, you could do all that stuff, but uh, not every... So, the people that I treat, um, they're in pain that day when they come in. And what I love about the um, ability to provide treatment the same day is uh, they get the help they need today. And um, they're very grateful for it. I've had great success um, uh, with that. Put this one up here. Oh yeah, for uh, for patients' teeth that don't have much height or contour, is there a problem for retention of the appliance grind relief? <clears throat> Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, let me tell you. Um, you know the grind relief um, it, it operates on the same principles uh, as the uh, NTI. The NTI is is smaller, uh, and I think. You've all seen NTIs, but you know, and it has the bar uh, going over the top. Uh, so, uh, and the NTI uh, is to me the, the benchmark. It's been uh, proven to uh, reduce muscle activity. Uh, clinically, uh, tests show uh, migraine, uh, headache uh, treatment, uh, good success in 85% of the uh, test group. Um, but um, uh, I think the it's not going to have quite the retention that the um, that the um, grind relief has. The grind relief, and what I like about the grind relief is it, um, it if you've got a long centric like my wife, 
I uh, can go back. I'm not going to be on the NTI, but I will be with the uh, with the um, Grand Relief Pro. So um, it it gives, uh, but it also gives that uh, a little. More, you've got more retention, and with the short teeth, yeah, that can be a, a problem. But you know, because of the uh, the, the, the longer extension, uh, we're a, we seem to get a, 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 a we don't have much problem with that. And uh, again. If, if depending on the preference, I've got some questions here that have uh, pre-submitted. Um, what do you prefer? What uh, the preference to make whatever device? If you're making the horseshoe, whatever you make, it upper, lower, whatever. I've worn it all. I've I've had like uh, like I say, I've been the patient. I've had thirty years of it. I've worn the horseshoe upper, lower, and um, over the years for myself. And uh, my patients, I found more compliance and, and more comfort with the lower. Okay, but it's, it's some dentists uh, that's what they're taught in school, and they're just going to keep doing that. But uh, I, I found better compliance with the, with the lower appliance. And um, if so, that if you did have, you know, some people ground their lower anterior, so you know, there's just not much. The other option is to make it for the upper. And when I do that, a lot of times I'll grind off the uh, the the anterior, the dome here to make it so it's uh, the lip is not, uh, uh, you know, it's not uncomfortable for the lip. And um, okay. Let's see. Okay, so uh, you know, let me just go. To, I'm going to go to some of the uh, uh, other questions um, that I have that were pre-submitted. Uh, particularly, uh, with, with, let me tell you about uh, children, um, because uh, yeah, I'm seeing this uh, and, and children and, and adolescents, teenagers, twenty. You know, uh, that's a little different. But I'm talking about children that young as six, seven years old. And um, uh, I think this is the only, I don't know of another appliance besides, besides the uh, Grand Relief Pro that would do this. I have a patient that um, she's had great success with the, she had the migraines, everything is really struggling. And um, she's wearing it for a couple of years. And then she noticed her son was, uh, she could hear him at night. He was, uh, he was grinding his teeth. So she, uh, we got the we got the grand relief uh, for Christian is his name, and um, and the kid loved it. And he was like six, seven, I'm not sure. And he's wearing it. He gets it. He wears it. And and she said, Christian, um, how do you like that? And he said, Oh, I you know, I, I like it. It's really good. He goes, uh, you know, I don't have that pain anymore. And she said, What pain? You never told me about any pain. He said, well, I had headaches every day and he uh, was not performing well in school. And, uh, but now he doesn't have that anymore. He's doing better. And I'll tell you what, that uh, those kind of stories just uh, really uh, warm my heart, but it's, it's an option and uh, the, 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 the children that, uh, that do this. But one other thing I want to talk about as far as, um, that kind of tip off with the, the child is, is clenching or grinding in their below puberty. My feeling is if you've got that tip off, they're, they may not, but they're probably not having uh, the musculoskeletal alignment that they should. And so when it comes time for orthodontics, there should be a tip off that uh, you don't want to just line those teeth up cosmetically. You want to find the, the job that the orthodontist should be attuned to finding the jaw position that uh, is going to be in harmony. Maybe you're not going to totally, you know, some people have perfect jaw position, joint anatomy jaw position. With enough stress, they're still going to clench. But it'd be an opportunity uh, uh, to take uh, when you get that heads up. Uh, to try to address that as uh, orthodontic treatment may become involved later. And, and, and that brings me to another interesting question that was pre-submitted uh, by a dentist. So this is for the dentist himself. And he said um, uh, that, oh yeah, he's been, uh, he's been a clencher. I've been clenching, grinding for 12 years. 
And, um, but just the last year and a half that uh, I've been having migraine headaches, but he's undergoing, uh, sounds like a Linus, uh, Invisalign, it sounds like. So he's, he's now, he's uh, wearing a Linus to try to get for cosmetic um, improvement and such, but how do I treat my migraine headaches and all that? And I started thinking about, well, gee, how do I, I can't wear the plants and what am I gonna do? He's got to, he's got to have the align, uh, liners in there. And I thought, what, you know what, wait a minute. <clears throat> need to go back stop the orthodontic treatment get yourself into the, the harmonious uh muscle joint position and i would recommend what i don't know you don't have to do myotronics but you, oh, oh, typically opening the vertical is, is is going to be where you want to start you start with a and, and wear a splint and you might wear it in, you know 24 7. And when you, and then when you find out, you know, okay, this is where I should, this is where my, my uh, anatomy is, is comfortable. Sometimes you can, after that, you can switch on to the bonding on uh, with, with um, uh, composite or such, opening that vertical, keep it in, it's like a bonded splint <clears throat> and they, they function with it. Okay, now you've got, you, you know where you, you would be happy as far as uh, more pain-free and such. And then look at the orthodontics and say to the orthodontist, okay, this is where I'm good, uh, I, but I don't wanna wear this all the time. Uh, how about we bring the teeth into that position? And uh, I, I think that uh, it's a more practical way to, to, to look at it. Bruxism in children, is it related to respiratory pathology? That's a good one because, you know, uh, and, and absolutely, to let's take a take a look at that. That would be, you know, now you want to go to your ENT. Take a look at the tonsils, adenoids, the the airway, because there's, there's definitely a link. But I, you know, again, I'm not sure it's a one to one link. Um, uh, the any more than the that you have to have TMJ pathology uh, to. Um, predicate bruxism. As the ADA has said, 95% of people at some time in their life will brux and they don't all have uh, TMJ pathology. So, um, okay, here's here's another, I'm glad somebody asked this. Okay, because it's, it, it's, I see Amazon sells grind relief. How is patient compliance with grind relief? Is the appliance too bulky? We haven't, no, I haven't had a lot of, uh, 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 problems with uh, the, the bulkiness of it. Uh, it's actually smaller than, um, than the, of course, the horseshoes and such. But uh, I, I haven't had this problem. But, you know, it's the point. I'm glad you brought about Amazon because, you know, I've, I've sold uh, these devices. I, I tried to be <clears throat> uh, altruistic, I guess. And, and so many people have these problems. I looked at the over-the-counter devices and I'm like, oh my God, they're junk. Terrible. And, um, and I, I wanted to help as many people as I could, you know, and, and so I, I did uh, put it there. But the problems that I ran into were um, not, uh, uh, you know, we have a four-star rating, okay? 60% uh, five-star, 20% uh, uh, four-star. Tremendous stories of success. But I found by and large that uh, the public at large is just not, smart enough to understand the difference between what I'm doing and, uh, and a $9 rubber horseshoe. And so we spend this money and try to get the website right and 90 way percent would bounce. And so it just wasn't, um, you know, it's just something. And then if they got it, some of them, you know, what, look at the video. No, I have time for that. It just doesn't work. So it became frustrating. And then I started, we started showing it to uh, some top dentists. I mean, some, some really uh, nice high end people at, at Tufts, uh, some uh, people that are, you know, uh, not your average dentist. And um, they went, wow, this is good. You know, this is, this is a, this is a way better than uh, the other, any other anterior uh, disclosure device that I've seen. And so um, uh, we are, we've going, we're, we're going, to, to the 
dental professional, right? where it can be formed properly. And this different modification, sometimes you might have to do a little adjustment. The patient has long cuspids uh, and, and this interference, you might have to adjust the appliance so that you don't, uh, so that they need to, they need to have primary focus uh, when they bite together and, and, and it will adjust, it, it self adjusts right at the midline, upper and lower pressure at the midline. Uh, so there's some case, so I, I just think it's better uh, in the hands of the professional and the, the fit, uh, everything. And then what I, uh, one thing that I've started doing lately is making it, uh, it I've done it a little bit, but late, the more I do, and I see the success, the more I want to do this. And it's, it's making the grind relief a lot on, the, on the one arch. And well, you can see, I don't know if you can see this, uh, uh, there's a, a full arch suck down O2O splint on the up. And when, when I do that, I get a little extra vertical. The free glide of the mandible is just so smooth. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting some great results with that. So that I'm, I'm doing it more, especially, no, it is not something that it's necessary. It's an option. Uh, you can do it, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and I've had some, uh, level of success. The grind relief alone uh, has been um, just, uh, you know, it's been a, a tremendous uh, uh, asset. And I, I did it because it, I was led to it because I had a lot of patients. I was making the, the $500 horseshoe and people come back and apologize. I'm sorry, doctor, I can't wear this. It's too, I just can't, it's too bulky. And I started experimenting and finding with prototypes and I found the uh, much better compliance and, and comfort. They would just much better success, clinical success. So I, um, that's what got me started on it, that along with my own being the, the patient myself. Um, so uh, one particularly uh, with this combination device, I have a friend, um, good friend, is, is he's married a gal from Thailand. And I made her the grind relief below uh, be, before, but it, now she lost it. And, and, and she's now she's got tinnitus and she's got vertigo so bad that she can't drive the car. And she's got shoulder pain, neck pain, headache pain. And uh, I, I, I said, uh, Nathapam, I think um, I'd like to try that. I think this could, could help you. Oh my God. She says, you know, I talked to her. Uh, a week later, she said, oh my God, within one day, the tinnitus had resolved, the, the vertigo gone, uh, and, and her head and neck pain. And then she says, but I, I, I got so much energy. I stay up till one o'clock. I, I, I'm like, well, that's great. But, uh, you know, it just made my, it's nice to make money. But I'll tell you what, there's that, uh, that kind of uh, satisfaction is priceless. And, uh, you know, I, I, I get that. This is, that was an unusual case, but it sh shows, um, you know, uh, how multifaceted these comorbidities are. And, uh, and they are, I guess, as, as I go through the course, I can't emphasize enough that um, I believe this is a, a way underdiagnosed. There are, you know, you're looking for, the frat, tooth fracture, the caries, the, the periodontal disease, crowns, uh, restored, uh, restored operative dentistry and such. And I think under the radar, these people are there. Uh, they, they're there. And uh, so one of the things also that I, that I like to do in my office, well, by the way, uh, another question that I had is, how do, you, how do you convince people that they should do this? I don't think it should be a one-man show. Uh, my whole staff is so attuned to this, whether it's my hygienist, my assistant, that this message, they, a lot of times, yep, they, and they got it, and, and, they, you know, and I go, yep, that's right, I feel that cheek musculature, that's a clencher, and, uh, you know, it's right there, but it's like the pink elephant in the room sometimes, um, you got to start getting tuned in on it, these people need help. In my waiting room, <clears throat> what I, I do, uh, because, uh, you know, people are, you get a little time out there. I, I have uh, this set up in my waiting room, and um, because all of a sudden I'm a master diagnostician, you know, they come in and go, "Yeah, I, I got, I, I've got a problem with clenching, grinding my teeth," and uh, it sets it sets it up. Uh, there's a lot of people, and it's the stress today. There's no question. Uh, one of my 
pre-questions was how can you relate stress to bruxism well i mean uh it's you don't have to be sherlock holmes here this is uh you see what's going on and i've and, you know practiced long enough what i've seen before and what i see now is uh, that the stress levels are uh, unbelievably high and uh, so that uh, I, I don't have a clinical study, but uh, I, I can tell you that I, I think most people can uh, uh, can associate the, the, the high degree of stress with this uh, hyper hyperactivity of the muscles. Um, let me see. Do we have anything? A lot of a lot of thing about ch children and teenagers. Yeah, I'm. It, it, it's uh, the, the pedodontists are. Um, is um. Uh, you know these questions. They're seeing it, and and what do you do? Uh, there's there's, there's uh, the, this. The only thing I I know is that is the uh, reformable device, and um, the gal that I mentioned with her son Christian, she's reformed that device about six times because it's changing dentition. But you can do that. Uh, you have that uh, ability, and um, you know these these kids need help, and I'm seeing it in the uh, teenagers uh, in, in the twenties. Gosh, you know, they look at what, you know, they're, they're, what do they got to look forward to? And uh, that's, some, that's some stress. So, um, you know, it, it, you, got, you need some options for them. And I, I don't know uh, of, of a lot of other than, than that. Um, David Goldshaw <laughs> in Canada. We will be talking to you, David, uh, shortly. Uh, we want to we, we, we want to plan to uh, to work with you in Canada and um, yeah, we'll we'll cover uh, a, the uh, any regulatory problem. It's not a not a high bar to to uh, cross there. Uh, what other? Well, it, it is not, if you're using a full arch splint, and then I've got this question before. What do you? Um, uh, how, how would you adjust it? The one question was, um, okay, this guy's got, uh, you know, uh, uh, his, his uh, anterior uh, overjet, uh, uh, not overjet, but uh, uh, he, he's, he's got about a, a five, six millimeter uh, vertical overjet. What would you do? How would, how, what about a horseshoe splint? How would you do that? And I, my thought is, well, I, I want to build that posterior up to the point that his the splint will uh, so that your your vertical overjet will be about you know one and a half millimeters two millimeters or so and so and then establish anterior guidance in, in, in the splint and I think that uh, that's uh, one of the better ways to go uh, with that patient. So um, let me see. And then this, another question, pre questions, uh, how do you determine cases that need to reestablish uh, the vertic uh, vertical mention? Uh, you know, I see people with all, all types of uh, like flat occlusion. I don't see, I'm not seeing a ton of overclose, but I think it really becomes uh, not a one size fits all. You ask the patient, are they having are they having, and a lot of people, some of these people don't have pain, um, but uh, it's it's not, I don't try to sell um, the full mouth reconstructions or, or, or that, I, you know, I, I listen to the patient uh, and um, I let them know it's available. It, it's, uh, it's not gonna be cheap. It's not gonna be easy, uh, but it, it can be done. I have um, Practice where I, I treat the, uh, the the average person. They, they they're not all uh, you know uh, uh, loaded with money, and I I'm interested in trying to help as many patients as I can um, to keep them comfortable and functioning. Um, the gamut's open there as far as um, you know um, uh, you know what to do with these people, but I, I kind of let them guide me, and you know I let them know, hey, we can do this. Um, but if they can't, I, I, I try to manage them and, uh, and, and, and get them functional. And I, and I do that in a, in a high uh, degree of patience. One of the, one of the biggest things is uh, 
you know, not just getting to get the device, but having them wear the device, compliance. And so the, the problem sometimes with, if the device is, uh, you know, you can't adjust it. If they leave it out, so people wear these episodically so that, uh, you know, they leave it out for a week or two. And if you've got, you know, a device that, uh, for example, a horseshoe that's, you know, it's it, in the teeth move slightly, that's not going back in and good luck trying to refit it, spot that out. And uh, so, but I, so I like the ability to uh, have a, have it uh, reformable, um, whatever period of time later, because these, like, again, even the pain is episodic. One of the questions I got here, is how can you tell when a patient is uh, stopping, uh, they're not bruxing anymore? And I have people say, well, I decided uh, I'm not going to do that anymore. So uh, I said, well, that's fantastic. I <laughs> said something when you're sleeping, you can control that. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it is uh, something that is, is so stress related. I had a gal, she was a, um, she was a system of mine years ago. She came in. I don't have many people that come in with a primary symptom being ear pain, but she did. She had ear pain and had been to the EMT um, 10, I don't know how many times. He said, Carolyn, you, there's no ear infection. Why don't you see your dentist? Well, that was a, that was nice. And not a lot of them got that. I made her a splint. Boom. She was good. She was good. You know? So I didn't see her for a couple of years. And I said, um, so Carolyn, how are you doing? Are you, are you wearing the splint? She goes, oh no, no, I don't need that anymore. Said, what happened? She goes, well, I changed my job. I got a, a new boss. He's much nicer. And it, it was like, well, that, there's a case study in uh, stress. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so it, it comes and goes, but I, I, my personal feeling is that uh, even with, um, you know, you've, got, you've got good occlusion, cuspid rise, anterior guidance, uh, you know, everything's good. With enough stress, uh, you, you, you could use some, some help, particularly at night. Now, uh, for me, um, uh, I, I wear the I wear the Moses uh, because I at night, uh, and if I take a nap, I've got the grind relief in. I lift weights, I got the grind relief in. Sometimes I'm driving, I put the I don't go anywhere without it. I got mine in my pocket right here, but uh, um, it, it's uh, it's something that uh, when when you, when you can feel that stress coming on, um, I I think it's helpful to do uh, to intercede. So uh, it, it's it's. Um, let me see if I have uh, any other questions here. Let's see. Nothing new there. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, we got. Okay. You see anything new there? That's okay. Clear. All right. So then I'm going to go to uh, maybe some other of the uh, pre. Uh, submitted questions. Um, well, yeah, uh, when it comes to, <clears throat> so differential diagnosis, uh, they're clenching, they're, they're clenching or they're grinding. You know, is, is it related to stress, apnea or malocclusion? Well, you know, I, I think you got to uh, take a look at the you know, as you get particularly, and it could be ch child too. I don't. I, that that is something uh, to uh, to evaluate. And when I see people with, uh, typically it's lar uh, larger people, and you look and that uh, airway is 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 just uh, obstructed. They uh, they're more predisposed uh, to the uh, uh, clenching grinding. But I, I'd like to get them out to a sleep study, and. Um, and, and, and take it from there. Okay, uh, see, where do you purchase grind relief? Uh, well, we have uh, the grindreliefpro.com, uh, the clenching root canal. Uh, how do you diagnose that? Well, it, it's, it's not that, it's not, not too hard. I showed some of them on the, um, on the course. But um, basically, these people come in and they're in pain. Uh, this is, and you know, when you see no caries, uh, no pathology. Um, I just did a, I just did a, a couple endos on 24 and 25 young gal. Uh, you know, stress. And by the way, if you don't have an, if you don't have something 
to intercede when these people clench and they will go into protrusive okay uh, at night uh, they may have they, their centric maybe reverse of that but they will go out there at night and they they get on these centrals she devitalized them and um uh, the, it'll be pretty evident when you see no other uh, cause for it uh uh the same thing with you look at these cases of um resorption okay and uh resorption is caused from the osteoclastic activity you know whether internal or external but it's usually related to trauma i've seen it when people get an accident all of a sudden they get resorption but i've talked to i have some friends that are endodontists and i and don lecture i said you know what carl i i'm seeing uh this uh uh problem more and more and I, I think i don't see any other explanation that it's uh that it's clenching and grinding and he said joe yeah i think you're right and we are seeing a lot of it whether it's endo from um uh, bruxism clenching or resorption too and of course tooth fracture i'm seeing i mean i just had to, this fella come in with number 18 split right down the middle i mean just like a sandwich and from clenching so this is uh an epidemic how about yeah botox okay yeah and i have um i i had a patient uh that he he was so he he, he traveled i think it was since uh, now I don't know, at like twice a year he'd get the botox in uh the masseters the pterygoids and he was so it was so tough i ended up making him the grind relief and um uh he just got uh, it didn't wasn't totally he still it was way reduced and um so uh, but botox yeah that's where they're going i mean they're going into the into the um uh, sometimes maybe uh pterygoids uh, uh or a temporalis i mean and um but um yeah they're they're uh, they understand what's going on uh, when when the hyperactivity of the the head and neck uh, and the jaw muscles can give that what i call reflex contraction uh and, and trigger these other muscles and so they get migraine relief from injections and into the uh, pterygoids and uh, masseters and such. There's the clean one there. Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, how, can you disinfect it? Yeah, of course. And uh, you can, you know, the various, uh, the, there's uh, denture uh, cleaners. We're probably going to in, include uh, in, in our uh, kit uh, a, a professional uh, with, with our package the, um, disinfecting powders but you could go also with with a peroxide uh and uh, and you can brush it it's not going to damage it uh so that, that's uh disinfection is, is is not a problem um <laughs> my reconstruction looks good okay uh yeah it, it's uh, it was the option you know i from for me uh, you know i let me just tell you one thing uh, about my reconstruction. Um, you know, I worked with a, my mentor. I worked with he's a TMJ specialist, uh, Dan Schwab, as I mentioned. And um, he, with TENS units and the, and the uh, myotrax, established my where, where I should be. And then I worked with a prosthodontist, but he was more old school. And he said, eh, I don't know, this doesn't, you know, I think your vertical's open too much. And so he, he said, let's just take three millimeters off there. Oh my God. You know, once you decompress this joint, and, and I was a class two division two, okay, so I was jammed up there. I was good for many years until I started getting a little older. And then all of a sudden, you know, all my troubles came and I had to do something. It was going to be surgery, uh, which I, uh, or, or, or orthotics or whatever. I, I went with the um, prosthetic, but so he said, okay, let's close it. He closed me about three millimeters. And I'm telling you within three days, I was in, so I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I had, fortunately I had some, um, um, it's the same material, same thermoplastic that's in the grind relief. And I made myself a splint at three o'clock in the morning so I could sleep and function for a couple days when I went back and said, uh, uh, Mike, uh, you got to put that back. And he did. And, 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 you know, a lot of dentists look at that, my con down two thirds down the eminence, but, uh, you know, uh, my muscles are happy. 
and uh, and, and I'm I'm functioning uh, quite well. So it's different. Not what I was taught in school. If I said anything like that when I was in uh, University of Detroit, they they they, they, they I, I mentioned. I said, "Why is rum position uh, the only thing? Don't you ever ask that question again. We'll slap you upside the head." You know, and it's like. And, and now I find it, well, you know what, it may be, maybe the muscles and the skeletal harmony are not always ideal. And, but I, if you don't make the muscles happy, it's not, things aren't going to work out well for you. Do, do you, do you recommend night guards for patients with CPAP? Yeah. Okay. So I, I have some, of course, I got a lot of patients with CPAP. But yeah, the one uh, I've got said that they wear the, the, the appliance with the CPAP and um, it's been quite, uh, it's worked out well. So, you know, it's something that you can throw into the mix because I, they, they still may be having uh, some clenching issues. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it can be, you can do that. But I think we're, okay, I'm getting you by Rhyme Relief in Europe. Uh, Right now, uh, not yet. It would have to be uh, here. And um, but uh, again, direct questions to um, grindreliefpro.com, and we will uh, see what we can do. Uh, we don't have a barrier. We don't have a high bar regulatory barrier. Is pretty much non-existent. So I, I think uh, I'll have to check with my agent um I'm a regulatory agent but we could we could probably work something out i think we're about uh um do you ever see any case of the bite shifting with with, with it? let me oh, and okay anterior open bite yeah i mean it can happen and that, my device uh it, it's i've seen it very rarely but when you combine the upper uh, splint with that uh it it can uh, help prevent that the, but the, i will tell you once in a while what, what happens the because of the deprogramming of the muscle with the anterior device sometimes it'll get the the, the pterygoids and the mass to relax so much all of a sudden the patient's got a posterior open bite and then and it doesn't go there the teeth haven't moved the muscles have gone into harmony and the bites open. They got a choice. Do you reconstruct or put a bonded on splint into the happy position for the muscles or stop wearing it, go back into pain and have your teeth occlude. So, you know, but that's, that's the warnings are on there. People should, should know about that. And they, and the instructed, if your bite doesn't go back to normal with a, in an hour uh, of wearing you discontinue, but it's very rare. But I think we're all, I think we're uh, at, at 930. Yep. Thank you.